Hello, my name is Ben Zamora and I represent Wild Wealth Management Group. In this estate planning presentation, we'll take a look at some general estate planning concepts and strategies. While there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all estate plan, this overview may assist you in thinking about your own estate planning needs. It may help you determining whether you might benefit from working with a financial planning professional. Again, my name is Ben Zamora. I am an investment advisor representative, and I've been in the industry since 2006. I most recently moved to the Wild Wealth Management Group um, last year in 2020, and graduated from ASU's W.P. Carey School of Business Management. In addition, I have a certificate from the Boston Institute of Finance in Financial Planning. Here at the Wild Wolf Management Group, we have 16 financial advisors in three locations across the valley and one north in Payson to help with your wealth management needs. In addition, we have a support staff of, six, of 16 that helps assist our clients' daily needs. What is an estate plan? Simply put, it's a map of how you want your personal and financial affairs to be handled in case of incapacity or death, and the subsequent implementation of the strategies that will fulfill those objectives. Who needs an estate plan? Chances are you do. You may think that estate planning is just for the wealthy, but it's not. In fact, an estate plan may actually be more important if you have a smaller estate because your final expenses will have a much greater impact on your estate and there's a much greater possibility that your loved ones could suffer from the lack of financial resources. The fact is, without an estate plan, you can't control what happens to your property if you die or become incapacitated. Generally, people create estate plans because they want that control. They also want to make sure that their wishes are clear in order to avoid family disputes. In addition, they care about preserving their property for their loved ones, and they want to make sure that their loved ones are properly provided for. An estate plan is especially important if your spouse isn't comfortable with your financial matters, you have minor children, your net worth exceeds the federal transfer tax exclusion amount, you own property in more than one state. Financial privacy is a concern, or you own a business. These are the estate planning concepts we'll be looking at today. We'll talk about planning for incapacity first, briefly discussing both healthcare issues, property management issues. Then we're going to talk about planning for death, focusing on wills and probate, tax basics, lifetime gifting, life insurance, and trust. Incapacity describes a condition in which you are legally unable to make your own decisions. We're talking about planning for incapacity first, because incapacity could happen to anyone at any time. Think for a moment what might happen if, for example, you were to become the victim of an accident that puts you in a coma for several months. How would your doctor know what medical treatments you would want or not want if you can't speak for yourself? How would your personal business be transacted if no one is authorized to sign documents for you? What would happen is this. Someone would have to go to the court and get legal permission to do things for you. And that person is called a guardian and is usually a close family member, such as a spouse or child. would have to go back to the court every time permission is needed. As you can imagine, this might be quite burdensome to that guardian. Further, without any prepared instructions from you, 
your guardian might make decisions that would be different from what you would have decided. Let's talk about healthcare directives first. You can leave instructions about your medical care you would want if conditions were such that you couldn't express your own wishes. There are three different ways to do this with a living will, verbal power of attorney, and do not resuscitate me, DNR order. A living will is a document that lists the types of medical treatments you would want or not want under particular circumstances. For example, your living will might state that you would not want life support. If you fell into persistent vegetative state with a living will, you have to think about all the possible scenarios where you would want specific action to be taken. And then puts your wishes in writing so that the reader will clearly understand them. A durable power of attorney for healthcare, a healthcare proxy lets one or more family members or other trusted individuals who are called agents make medical care decisions for you. Unlike a living well, with this type of healthcare directive, you don't have to envision specific circumstances. Simply grant authority to your agent or agents to make decisions for you. A do not resuscitate order is used for a different purpose. Let's say that you're in the hospital, lingering and suffering with terminal illness, and you don't want the hospital staff to take life-saving measures. You suddenly go into cardiac or respiratory arrest, to make sure your wishes are carried out, you may be able to get your doctor to issue a DNR. A DNR is a legal form signed by both you and your doctor that's posted by your bed to give staff members the permission they need to carry out your wishes. Be careful if you're using a DNR. Some states require their own DNR form. Some states require one DNR form. If you're in the hospital and a different DNR form, DNR form if you're in the nursing home. Now let's take a look at some property management tools. There are three ways you can plan to have your financial affairs taken care of for you in the event you become incapacitated. You can arrange to your own property jointly, appoint an agent, use durable power of attorney, or create and put property in a living trust and name someone to take over the management of the trust if something happens to you. Granting joint ownership of your property to another person allows that person to have the same access to the property as you do. If you become incapacitated, your joint owner simply acts instead. For example, if you and your spouse have a joint checking account, each of you can make deposits and write checks. So if you go into a coma, your spouse would, be, would still be able to make mortgage payments on time. Verbal power attorney lets you name family members or other trusted individuals to make financial decisions or transact business on your behalf. In addition to joint ownership and durable power attorney, using a living trust is another common strategy. We'll talk in more detail about trust later, but for now, just know that the living trust can be used in planning for incapacity because someone called a successor trustee can step into your shoes to manage the property in the trust if something were to happen to you. All of us make plans that are based on the possibility that a specific event may occur. Many of us carry more than the minimum required amount of auto insurance because we recognize the possibility that financial loss could result from an accident. Since it is 100% certain that each of us is going to die at some point, you might think that everyone would have an estate plan. The fact is, though, that's just not the case. So what happens if you die with no estate plan? If you own property jointly, that property may pass automatically to your joint owner upon your death. If you have an IRA or retirement plan or your own life insurance, funds may pass automatically to your designated beneficiaries when you die. Similarly, Property held in a trust may pass automatically to a designated beneficiary. In general, however, property will pass according to the state intestacy laws. 
These laws govern the disposition of property when someone dies without a will or with a will that doesn't account for the portion of his or her estate. So let's say you die, leaving 5,000 in, sa in a savings account. Who does the money go to? Without instructions from you, the money would go to the person or people that your state's intestacy laws say they should go to. Intestacy laws vary from state to state. But here you see a typical pattern of distribution. 50% of the property goes to the spouse, 50% to the children. Remember, it may be different in your particular state. The biggest issue with intestacy is the fact that your actual wishes are irrelevant. Let's assume that you live in a state that has intestacy laws, patterned as shown on the slide. Without an estate plan, regardless of your actual wishes. For example, let's say that you want all of your property to go to your spouse and none to your children. Your estate plan would be divided between your spouse and your children. There are many potential problems with allowing your property to pass by intestacy. For example, the distribution pattern imposed by your state's intestacy laws could result in disputes among your heirs and the higher overall taxes do. Intestacy can be particularly problematic for unmarried couples. Since intestacy laws generally would not include an unmarried partner in distribution of the property. There's a very simple way to avoid a test. So we can create a will. How many people here have a will? A will is probably the most vital piece of anyone's estate plan. A will is a legal document in which you direct how your property will be dispersed. When you die, it also allows you to name the executor to carry out your wishes, which are stated in your will. In addition, your will lets you name a guardian or your minor children. You can also create a trust in your will. You can use a will to accomplish other estate planning goals as well, such as tax planning. To be valid, your will must be in writing and signed by you. Your signature must also be witnessed although the number of witnesses required varies from state to state. These requirements are important because if you aren't careful, your will may be invalid. So see an estate planning attorney to take care of this for you and avoid any do-it-yourself solutions. Now there is one big consideration to have, having a will with some people. And that's the fact that wills generally have to go to a process known as probate. We'll take a look at that process next. Most wills have to be probated. The rules vary from state to state, but in some states, smaller estates are exempt from probate or qualify for expedited process. So what does probate entail? Probate starts with someone filling the will with the probate court, which then oversee the estate settlement process. Usually the person named as the executor in the will does this. Once the will is filed, with the court and validated, the executor can go about the business of settling the estate. This means collecting monies owed to the person who died, such as wages, paying for outstanding bills, filing final income taxes and estate tax returns if necessary, and then distributing the remaining property to the rightful heirs. Usually everything goes smoothly during the probate process. This typically lasts anywhere from a few months to a year, depending on the size of the estate as long as the executor does what needs to be done in a timely fashion, and there are no family squabbles. Nevertheless, some people may want to avoid the process. Let's take a look at why this is so. Before we look at the reasons why you might want to avoid probate, let's review the positive aspects of probate. For most estates, there's usually little reason to avoid probate. The actual time and cost involved are modest, and it just doesn't make sense to plan around it. And there's actually a couple of benefits from probate. 
because the court supervises the process, you have some assurances that your wishes will be abided by. And if a family squabble should arise, the court can help settle the matter. Further, probate offers some protection against creditors. As part of the probate process, creditors are notified to make their claims against the estate in a timely manner. If they do not, it becomes much more difficult for them to make their claims later. For some complex estates, probate can be burdensome, taking up two or more years to complete. This can tie up your property that your family may need immediately and also increase costs that can arise such as executor fees, attorney fees, and insurance costs. And if you have real estate in more than one state, for example, if you own a summer home in Maine and a winter home in Florida, your executor will have to file in each state where the property is located. This is to refer to as ancillary probate. Additionally, wills and any other documents submitted in the probate become part of public record, which may be undesirable if you or your family members have privacy concerns. If any of these issues are a concern to you, an estate plan can be designed to limit the assets that pass through probate. To avoid probate altogether, the major ways it can be passed outside probate are by owning property jointly, by ensuring that beneficiary designation forms are completed for those types of assets that allow them, such as IRAs, retirement plans, and life insurance. By putting property in the trust and by making lifetime gifts. Now let's switch gears a little and talk about estate taxes. There are three types of federal taxes that may be imposed when property is transferred from one person to another, either during life or death, or referred to collectively as transfer taxes. These taxes are the gift tax, the estate tax, and generation skipping transfer tax. We're gonna discuss transfer taxes on the federal level only, but be aware that Individual states may also impose their own transfer taxes as they generally affect smaller estates. It's important for you to get more information on transfer taxes imposed by your particular state. If you, the donor, transfer property to another person, the donee, during a life, the transfer tax may subject to the gift tax. The reason there's a gift tax is to prevent individuals from avoiding the estate tax by giving all their property away before they die. Gift tax doesn't apply to every lifetime gift though. For example, in 2020, you can give up to 15,000 to as many individuals as you want, gift tax free under the annual gift tax exclusion. By the way, the 15,000 figures is for 2020. But the annual gift tax exclusion is indexed for inflation. So it may change in the future. In addition, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from all transfers, that's the gift and your estate combined. The amount for that is 11,580,000 in 2020. That's the largest exclusion that has ever been allowed in the history of federal gift and estate tax. When property is transferred at death, it is generally subject to estate tax. This is true whether or not the property goes through probate. For example, even though the funds in an IRA pass by virtue of a beneficiary designation, the funds are still potentially subject to an estate tax. As with the gift tax, there are exemptions for the estate tax. For example, property that you leave to your spouse will generally not be subject to the estate tax because there's a full deduction allowed for the marital transfers. A similar deduction is available for property left to charity. In addition, as discussed on the previous slide, each individual has a lifetime exclusion from gifts, the estate tax combined. That amount is 11,580,000 for 2020. To be clear, there is one 11,580,000 exclusion 
that covers both gifts and estates. So any portion of the exclusion you use for gifts will not be available for your estate. There's a new feature of the lifetime exclusion that is potentially very important to married couples. The exclusion is portable. That means that any portion of the exclusion that is not used by the C spouse can be transferred to the surviving spouse. In prior years, that was not the case. So married couples for larger estates had to do what is referred to as bypass planning, typically using a trust. But for 2011 and later years, such planning will not be necessary for transfer tax purposes, although there are good reason to use a bypass trust. But that is more than we want to discuss today. Suffice it to say that together, a married couple can pass along $23,160,000 tax free as long as the estate of the deceased spouse makes the proper election on the estate tax return. The third piece of the transfer tax system that we need to mention is the generation skipping tax. In the world of estate planning, someone who is more than one generation below you, for example, a grandchild, a great grandchild, is referred to as a skip person. If property is transferred either during a life or at death to a skip person, then the transfer is subject to a generation skipping transfer tax, which is imposed in addition to a gift tax or an estate tax. The reason there's a generation skipping tax is to prevent individuals from avoiding estate tax on the intermediate skip generation. Because the generation skipping tax is a separate tax, you get a separate exemption. The exemption for the generation skipping transfer tax purposes is $11,580,000 in 2020. Unlike the gift and estate tax exclusion, the GST tax exemption is not portable. Some key tax figures are adjusted each year for inflation. You can see here how the exclusion and exemption amounts have changed. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act signed into law in December 2017 doubled the gift and estate tax exclusion amount and the GST tax exemption to 11,180,000 in 2018. The amounts are 11,580,000 in 2020. After 2025, they are scheduled to revert to pre-2018 levels and cut by about half. If your estate is larger than exclusion or exemption, you might want to do some estate planning to minimize the potential impact of transfer taxes. Making gifts during one's life is common, estate planning strategy that can also serve to minimize transfer taxes. In fact, transferring property to your heirs during a lifetime has certain advantages over waiting until you die. For one thing, when you make lifetime gifts, you have the satisfaction of senior recipients enjoy those gifts. For many people though, gifting used minimize transfer taxes. As mentioned earlier, one way to do this is take advantage of the annual gift tax exclusion, which lets you give up to $15,000 to as many individuals as you want gift tax free. And there are several other gift tax exclusions and deductions that you can take advantage of. In addition, when you gift property that is expected to appreciate in value, you remove the future appreciation from your taxable estate. There is one trade-off to a lifetime gifting though. Generally, if you give property during your life, your basis in the property for federal income tax purposes is carried over the person who receives the gift. So if you give your $1 million home that you purchased for 50,000 to your brother, your 50,000 basis carries to your brother. If he sells that house immediately, income tax will be due on the resulting gain. In contrast, if you leave property to your heirs, at death, they get a stepped up rate or step down basis on the property equal to the property's fair market value at the time of your death. So if you purchase a home for $50,000 and it's worth 1 million when you die, your heir gets a property with a basis of 1 million. If they then sell the home for a million, they have no federal income tax. 
Remember that this annual gift exclusion tax lets you give 15,000 to as many individuals as you want gift tax free in 2020. You and your spouse make gifts together. You can double that amount and give 30,000 to as many individuals as you want. If you're contributing to a child or grandchild section 529 plan, a type of tax deferred college savings plan, you can give 75,000 in 2020 gift tax free. Well, you have to report the gift over a period of five years. If you and your spouse contribute together, this amount is 150,000. Certain conditions apply in each case. Be aware that if you should die during the five year period, a pro rata share of the gift will be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. Also, be aware that 15,000 figures is indexed for inflation. So this amount may rise or fall in future years. In addition, there is no gift tax imposed on any amounts paid directly to an educational institution for individual's tuition. There is also no gift tax imposed to any amounts paid directly to medical care providers for individuals' medical care, care including payments for health insurance premiums. If you aren't inclined to make outright gifts, you might consider using a trust. The trust is a common and versatile estate planning tool We've already seen that the trust can play a role in planning for incapacity and in avoiding probate. In addition, you may want to use trust as part of the overall strategy to minimize transfer taxes. To have certain property managed by a professional and to provide for minor children, elderly parents, and other beneficiaries. And certain trusts can be established to protect your assets from future creditors. Most importantly though, trust can provide a means to administer property on an ongoing basis according to your wishes, allowing you to maintain a degree of control after property is placed in the trust, even after your death. What is a trust? Trust is a legal entity where someone who's called the grantor arranges another person who's called a trustee to hold property for the benefit of a third party who's called the beneficiary. Grantor names a beneficiary the trustee and establishes the rules the trustee must follow in a document known as a trust agreement. When you create a trust, you split the ownership of the trust property. Legal ownership goes to the trustee and beneficial ownership goes to the beneficiary. That means that the trustee is legally responsible for managing the property according to the trust rules and that the beneficiary receives the financial benefits such as income, principal, and the use and enjoyment from the trust property. A trust you create while you're alive is referred to as a living or inter vivos trust. A trust that is created upon your death, for example, under the terms of your will, is referred to as a testamentary trust. If you have the right to change or end the trust anytime you want to, trust is described as a revocable trust. The trust cannot be changed or revoked trust is described as an irrevocable trust. A revocable trust generally becomes irrevocable when you die, since you're no longer around to change or revoke it. While we won't go into great detail, revocable trusts are commonly used to plan for incapacity and avoid probate. A trust avoids probate because the trust agreement itself determines what happens to the trust property upon your death. Irrevocable trusts, on the other hand, are commonly used for transfer tax planning and creditor protection. Life insurance plays a part in almost everyone's estate plan in one way or another. For example, if you otherwise have a small or modest estate, life insurance can be used to actually create an estate. In other words, the life insurance proceeds will be the primary financial resource for, the, for your surviving family members, at least until they are able to access other financial resources. Life insurance can also be used to provide liquidity for your estate. That is, the life insurance proceeds provide the cash your survivors need to pay final expenses, outstanding debts, and taxes. For example, you may have physical assets such as home retirement plan and some investments that you do not want to be liquidated, but rather left intact for your surviving spouse. And life insurance can play many other roles as well, such as creating a bequest to a charity or providing funds for your child's education. You need to be aware, however, that 
The general rule is that life insurance proceeds will be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. Now recall that at the beginning of the presentation, I made it clear that we're only talking about taxes on a federal level here, and that the situation may be different on the state level. Recall also that I said that 11,580,000 is effectively excluded from the estate tax in 2020. So if your total estate, including the proceeds from your life insurance is equal or less than 11,580,000, you have no worries. But if the total estate is more than 11,580,000, then some of those life insurance proceeds may have to go to pay estate taxes. Although the general rule is that life insurance proceeds are included in the estate for the estate tax purposes, an estate plan can be structured to exclude life insurance proceeds from your taxable estate. The key issue is the ownership of the life insurance policy. A common strategy to avoid estate tax on life insurance uses a trust to own and hold the life insurance policy. Such a trust is commonly referred to as an irrevocable life insurance trust or ILIT. If the NILIT owns the life insurance policy, the proceeds of the policy will not be included in your estate for estate tax purposes. However, this is only true if the strategy is correctly implemented. Ultimately, you'll need to work with an experienced estate planning attorney if the strategy is of interest to you. But let me give you a basic idea of how an ILIT can work. You create an irrevocable trust name someone as a trustee and name beneficiaries. The trustee buys a new life insurance policy on your life. The islet owns the policy. You make cash gifts to the islet. The trustee notifies the beneficiaries as you make the cash gifts. The beneficiaries have a limited window of time during which they have a technical right to withdraw your cash gift, but they don't since withdrawing the gift would defeat the purpose of the trust. As the withdrawal period has elapsed, the trustee uses the cash gifts to pay the premiums on the policy to the insurance company. At death, the islet receives the proceeds of the life insurance policy. If properly implemented, no estate tax is due on the life insurance proceeds, and the funds are distributed according to the terms of the trust. Beneficiaries of the islet receive the funds free from estate tax. Like most trusts, irrevocable life insurance trusts are the mo a more advanced estate planning strategy. And I've just attempted to give you three very basic understandings of how they might apply to your situation. So if you are interested in learning more, I'd be happy to provide you additional information. As we wrap up, Take a moment to ask yourself these questions. Do you have a plan in place for incapacity? Do you have a will? If the answer to either question is no, there's really no time to waste. You need to address these issues as soon as possible. Ask yourself as well if transfer taxes are an issue for you. If you die today, would your total estate, including your home and life insurance, exceed the federal exclusion of $11,580,000 or less? Finally, even if you have an estate plan, does it reflect your current wishes and circumstances? These small steps can help enhance your financial life one day at a time. Questions are always welcome, and thank you for joining me and Wild Wealth Management Group today during this call.